Well, good morning and thank you so much for joining us from your living rooms at home on Facebook Live. We're glad that you would be here and that we can be there with you. We're looking forward to a good morning. I'll be honest with you, it's very different in here. It's not the same without you. I look forward to being able to get back together again soon, but until then, I'm thankful for this opportunity that we have. I'm going to take a moment. We're just going to pray now. I hope that if you've got your family together, you'll bow your head and join us in prayer and uh, that you would engage in the service with us this morning as we sing, that maybe you and your home would sing, as we open up the Word of God, that you would open up your Bibles as well, and that we'd be able to minister to you during this time. Let's pray together. Father, thank you uh, for the freedom that we have to still be able to do this Facebook Live, a live transmission. Father, I ask that you would uh, bless people at home, Lord, the people who will hear this video uh, both live and later and after the fact. Lord, be with our church family right now during this time. And uh, any guests who will be watching today, I ask that you would just help your word to permeate through. Lord, be with the other pastors and churches who are doing a live service today who've had to adjust. I ask that you just be with our country at this time, be with our church family at this time. Bless our, bless our worship this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord Bound to Him eternally my love Promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God My Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God One love and remember
You can also mail in your uh, donation there, and, uh, or your uh, tithe, rather. I pray, Lord, that, uh, that the Lord would use this, this, this to continue to bless our finances and to take care of the needs of the church and uh, to be with the missionaries that we support as well. The finances got to continue on, and we just ask that from the bottom of your heart you just give. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, thank the Lord and uh, praise him. God, we just love you so much, Father. Thank you for what you're doing here. God, thank you for this opportunity, Father, to give, to uh, bring glory and honor to the name of Christ, Father, and worship you through giving. We pray, Lord, that you'd use these resources to bring glory and honor to the name of Christ. God, that you would uh, continue to bless this church and keep it going, Father. God, thank you that uh, you're the ultimate giver and that you gave of your son, Jesus Christ, Father. And this is just a part of us to give as stewards. May we be the good stewards that you've called us to be and uh, continue to trust you during this time. Thank you so much for being a good God, a loving God. Pray, Lord, that the rest of the service would bring glory and honor to the name of Christ. Let your Holy Spirit fall upon each person listening today, Father. May they worship you and continue to worship you and sing out to you in their homes. And may you get the glory, honor, and praise through all that is done and said. God, I pray, Lord, that many lives are touched today. Thank you that your word is powerful. May it go forth and touch many lives today. May people be not merely hearers of your word, but doers of it. Transform lives today as only you can. We love you. Thank you so much. Glorify Jesus now. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
guys so much. Did a great job. And thank you, everybody at home, for participating thus far in our, our service this morning. I want you to, if you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of James. And we're continuing a series uh, through the book of James that uh, has been a blessing to me. I hope it's been a blessing to you as well. As we've looked at this letter written to a church that's scattered abroad, it's really uh, convenient. I'm thankful to the Lord that we are uh, not seeing something new today. Uh, I've heard people who are having to change and make adjustments on the fly with their ministries and their services, and, and it's difficult, but you understand that churches being unable to meet corporately in a building for times is not something new, and you see that in the early church where James is writing uh, to believers who are scattered out and are scattered abroad and going through some difficulties, and here's what he tells them to do in chapter number one. He says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That means that when things get difficult for the believer and when things get difficult for the church, to consider the upside to the thing. And he uses this words, count it all joy, this idea of considering it a, a joyful thing, because let's be honest, none of us feel joy in not being able to meet together. None of us feel a feeling of joy in, in difficulties that are taking place around the world. But if we dwell on the things we know more than the way that we feel, we'll have the peace that comes from the Holy Spirit uh, we find from the Word of God. He moves along and says, during these times, be very careful, James tells his audience, to be doers of the Word and not just hearers only. If I can be honest with you, um, it, it is easier to live a life and to claim a life of faith when everything's going well, isn't it? I think that we find, at least I do in my personal life and in our home, and I think if you're honest there at home with us this morning, that probably it's, it's easier uh, to, to pronounce our faith when everything is going well. But when things are difficult, it can be tough. And that's why James reminds us to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. He goes on, and we talked last week, about two different types of wisdom during difficult times. Now, James told us earlier in his letter that if anyone lacks wisdom during difficulties, let him ask of God, because God will give that wisdom out liberally. He's not tight-fisted with wisdom, and he'll give it to anyone who asks. So then he tells us last week, James, James uh, in his, his letter, we talked about the two types of wisdom that are out there. One, that is, the Bible says, earthly and sensual and devilish, right? This is the type of wisdom that focuses all about me. And I'm going to be honest with you. It is difficult not to try to cling to this at times of difficulty. When things are, are not going well, uh, the, the person that we want to care for the most is self. Right? We want to worry about, about myself and, and my home and, and my family and everything that's, that's going on with me. However, James tells us also about a wisdom that comes from above, which puts our focus outward. Okay, And in chapter number 4, uh, I want to look at the book of James and talk in verse number 13. It's interesting. I thought about changing my, my uh, passage, my preaching this morning, but I feel like the Word of God, we're going to continue going Next chapter, next verse through the book of James, because this is just so fitting, and I'm thankful for it. Look at chapter number 4, verse number 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell. This is a, a man James is talking about who's got plans for the future. And uh, I think all of us right now can agree that we have experienced a little bit of disruption in our schedules, haven't we? Kids are home from school. Moms and dads are home from work. There's, there's a lot of uh, schedule change. This man has made plans, James says. He's got plans to go to a place. He's going to stay there for a while. He's going to do some buying and selling and make some profit. Look what James says in verse number 14. Whereas you know not when uh, what shall be on the morrow... For what is your life? What a strong question that is, if you consider that. What is your life? I was talking to my friend Victor this week about this idea of, of what is your life. He told me about uh, a time when he was a younger man. He had a mentor who took him to a graveyard and 
had him go look at, you know, who can find the oldest grave here and who can find uh, the, the oldest person to, to have lived the longest, the oldest birth date. And all the, the gravestones in the graveyard have one thing in common. It's just a dash between two dates. And that dash really represents everything that's done in a life. And James asks this question that's that's really confrontational. And you you have to think about this. What is your life? He answers it for us. He says, it's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. He goes on in chapter number 5 to talk about riches, and and those who are seeking to to pile up wealth and, and goods for themselves, and sometimes are stepping over other people to do so. And he comes down to chapter number 7, and he says this, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Look at verse number 8. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I want to talk to you this morning about, if I I can be just transparent and honest with you, the first two things that come to mind uh, for everybody that I know in this time of crisis. Everybody that, that I know, and I'll admit even myself as as things came down and, and rules came from the governor and from CDC and from the White House, I begin to think, what is this going to do to my plans? And what is this going to do to our finances? By the way, I don't want you to think for a moment this morning that there's anything wrong with planning or, or being wise financially, but it's a problem for me. I'm giving this to you as an indictment on myself that the first thing I think of with difficulty is, What is this going to do to my schedule and to the money? James addresses these things. I want to look at these very quickly this morning. In the first part of uh, our our text this this morning in chapter number 4, James addresses schedules, and he points out just a few things I want to look at. The first thing is this. He says that there are a lot of assumptions made in our schedules. And if I can be honest with you, that's the way it is. Look at this man in verse number 13. There are four assumptions this guy makes. He says, we will go into such a city. So he's planning there as he's, he's looking into his future. He says, I'm going to leave where I'm at. I'm going to go somewhere. I'm going to arrive there. Everything's going to be okay between now and then. And then I'm going to continue there a year. I'm going to stay in the area for 12 months after I get there. Everything's going to go just fine. And then I'm going to buy and sell. I'm going to do some business there. I'm going to buy some goods and sell some goods. And then the fourth thing here, he says, and get gain. I'm going to go on a business trip, this man says. We're going to travel. Everything's going to be fine. I'm going to arrive in a place. We'll stay there for a year. We're going to buy and we're going to sell some things. I'm going to make some money and everything is going to be great. I don't know about you, but I had some plans that that were in this month and, and next month, things that sometimes we assume are going to be okay. Don't we do that? Aren't we, as human beings, the type that just assume once we make a plan, we just assume it is going to happen? I really believe that Americans especially, we sometimes worship the schedule or the calendar. We run everything that we can through that calendar, and and as long as these other things fit the need of the schedule, we'll make it happen. I want to submit to you this morning that I believe that we have an opportunity before us right now. Don't view this, this, uh, this time to stay home and, and obviously a time of some uncertainty as necessarily an obstacle, but what an opportunity we have because I believe as we're going to see going through this that the Lord is reminding us that He controls the schedule. We've all had things come up that, are, that have removed things from us and the assumption here is that whatever we plan will come to pass. Not only that, you're going to see there's an arrogance. There is a boasting in this schedule. The man painted in this picture by James walks about knowing everything is okay because he scheduled everything well. The administrators who are watching online right now, you, you feel me with this. The calendar is a disaster. If the schedule doesn't look good, it's, it's a stressful time. But as long as everything lines up right, right, we can be arrogant in our schedule. Everything's going fine. That's how we know that things are running well, right, is based on the schedule. There's this 
arrogance here. Now, now stay with me. We've got in our minds this idea that once we plan it, the default is that it's going to happen. And James is about to throw cold water in the face of this idea. By the way, this COVID-19 virus has thrown water in the face of this idea, hasn't it? The things that you had planned aren't taking place unless you plan to be in your house for a few weeks. Right? I've seen, I've seen people who've had to make adjustments in their weddings and, and funerals uh, that, that cannot go the way that you would like. You've got to have less than 10 people. People are postponing weddings and we're wondering about graduations. Look at the sporting events and, and all of these different things. And I think right now, if we can be honest, the world is getting a reminder that the schedule operates how God wants it to operate. You see third there that there is an absence in this schedule. Look at verse number 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Things that belong in our lives often take a secondary role to the priority of the schedule. Now listen, the problem is not with planning. The problem here is not even with the plan. The problem is the daily life running a plan and a schedule without God. And, and I, I'll be straight up with you, I am preaching to myself this morning. I'm kind of glad that this auditorium only has a couple of people in it because this is for me today. And here's the reality. My schedule needs to run through God's schedule. Unfortunately for us as believers, so many times we eliminate the necessary things. Now, listen, James is not talking here. We, we hear of sins of commission, right? Things you do that you should not. James is speaking of what we would call sins of omission. Things that we know we ought to do, but we don't have time to do them. We're too busy running and, and buying and selling and traveling and getting gain and making sure that we stick to the calendar. And James is reminding us that God controls the calendar and it's a timely message because today we should be reminded that we don't control our calendars. He does. You see, after he addresses the schedules in chapter number five, he goes on and begins to address stuff, right? Our goods. Our finances. Look at this, chapter number five. Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your ministries that shall come upon you, miseries that shall come upon you. Verse number two, your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. James has addressed probably the first thing that most of us consider when, when life comes to a screeching halt, and that is the schedule. What is this going to do in my future? But then he begins to talk about, about our goods, right? What is this going to do financially to my church? What is this going to do financially to my business? Man, look at the stock market. Look what it's done to my 401k. And we take all of these thoughts and these, these concerns for these different things, and he says, listen, when it comes to stuff, you've done a few things. The first thing he mentions here is what I would call hoarding, right? I'm surprised that James doesn't have toilet paper mentioned in here for such a time as this, right? Hoarding, these are, these are people who have gathered all of the goods. And listen, this is like the American dream that's pushed on us. The success you have is determined by the amount of things that you amass and the, the goods and the bank accounts. And I've said this before, it's almost like we're all in a competition and he who dies with the most toys wins. James is saying you've, you've hoarded all of these things and when the schedule's cleared out and it comes down to what really matters, this stuff was a waste. Not only does he talk about hoarding here, he talks about extravagance. Look at the gold and the, the silver, these riches that are listed here. It goes beyond just amassing as much as you can. There's almost in this picture, if you'll, if you'll imagine with me, an element of showmanship involved. It's not simply what can I get and what can I add and what kind of riches can I, can I, can I come up with, but it's almost got a, a look at me vibe to it. And boy, if that's not the American uh, way, I don't know what is. Our churches are full of people who 
spend their time chasing some kind of a corporate dream or trying to add to their bank account. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe the Lord is doing something in this time where he's reminding you, your finances are in my control. Can I be honest with you? I've been reminded of this the past couple of days. Well, I, I don't know of any pastor personally, and I've not talked to many about this, but I don't know of any pastor who when they find out, hey, you can't have a big corporate gathering, there's a couple of things we think, okay? Number one, man, I had a lot of stuff scheduled for the next few weeks. And number two, what is this going to do to the offerings? Shame on us. Shame on us. God is not surprised. God is not caught off guard by the things that are going on around us. Hasn't he always taken care of you, child of God? Hasn't he always sustained his church? Won't he continue to do that through the difficulty? Isn't that the point that James is making in his letter, writing to his scattered out church, who's going through difficulties where he says, you get so worked up during these difficulties about the schedule, you get so worked up during these difficulties about, about your goods, leave it up to God. Not only is there hoarding and extravagance, but there's injustice that comes with this. People are trampled in the pursuit of things. Chapter number five talks about these uh, laborers who have worked hard out in the fields and have had uh, money kept back from them. You know, there are people sitting at home this morning, uh, probably some of you watching, who don't, don't know where your paycheck's coming from next week. Right? These, these difficulties that come where you're thinking, man, I, I understand, Nick, what you're saying and, and not to be consumed by it, but it is a real thing. We're encouraged in this passage to be patient unto the coming of the Lord. I, I, just, I want to encourage my friends, my church family, people who I don't know at all who are probably watching this morning or will see this later. I want to, I want to encourage you in this. God knows what he is doing. The church goes through difficult times and comes out stronger. Study the book of Acts. Look at the way that the church has been through difficulty and, and, and tough times in, in its life and watch the way that God uses that to make it thrive. So we've talked about the fact that we always treat our schedule, often treat our schedule as ours and our finances as ours. We fit, it, fit God's plans or other things into our lives as long as it's convenient for us in these areas. And let's be honest, God has just cleared our schedules out. I don't know how long for. Hopefully not as long as, as some would predict. Maybe it's going to be a long time. I know this will be as long as God wants it to be. God's cleared our schedules out, and I want to acknowledge this morning very quickly the solution in this. If you have lost sleep like I have, if you have spent more time thinking and worrying than you should, let's look at this. James has just described a man, much like many of us today, a man who spends his busy life preoccupied with business, his calendar full of appointments, to the extent that he is consumed with them, and listen, he neglects to do the truly important things. There's a couple things that James tells us to do here. The first thing I want to look at is that he tells us to remember our life. Now, now look what he says here in chapter number 4, verse number 14. He, he issues this reminder. What is your life? Think about that question. During this difficult time, you've got a lot of time to sit and think. I sent my, my mom and my dad a video the other day, and I said, hey, if you have the time, watch this. And they texted back and said, oh yeah, we've got the time, right? If we've got abundance of anything right now, it's time. <laughs> he says, look and, and, and ask yourself this question, what is your life? If I was going to write your biography, what would I call it? No, I think we probably think of a lot of different things. And here's what James says, vapor. Vapor. Like when you have a boiling water and, and there's, there's a smoke vapor that comes off that thing and it's there just for a moment and then it's gone. During the difficult times when we're tempted to focus and, and let's be honest, kind of freak out about our, our schedule and, and the finances and all of the fallout, he says, remember your life. It's short. I read an article where somebody 
challenge people who, who and, and maybe you can do this. He challenged people and said, how many of you can give me the first name of your great-grandfather? The majority of people, to be honest, we don't know. We, we don't know. We could find it. We can go search it. We can ask somebody, but we don't know it. And I, and I think about the fact that that is just three generations ago. His blood is flowing through my veins. Isn't that, that reality just against what we typically believe in our minds? Right? Let's, let's just be honest for a moment. When we live life on a regular basis, we live life as though the world revolves around us. We're all guilty of this at times. Right? Whatever's convenient for me, I'm going to go do because, because I'm something and I've got to do this and, and I and I and I. And I hate to remind you of this, but God's word issues this sobering reminder that you are going to be born, you're going to live your life, and you're going to die, and the world is going to keep on running. Your life is a, a vapor. It's a quick thing. The point here that James is reminding you is that you don't have a whole lot of time. When we're young, we, we feel very often like we've got a, an unlimited future ahead of us, but the reality, according to the Word of God, is that, that life goes by fast, and the point is, spend the vapor of your life focusing on the things that truly matter. I've heard terrible stories of people sitting on their deathbed with millions of dollars in the bank, but without a family around them that loves them. I dread that idea. Life is quick. Focus on the things that matter. Not only that, he tells us to remember not only our life, but remember the giver of life. Look at verse number 15. What you ought to say is if the Lord wills, first we shall live. What a reminder we see here. That not only uh, is our life quick, but it's not controlled by us. Our life is in God's hands. If the Lord will, we shall live. You know, I think about God as the giver of life, and I can't help but to think of a couple of aspects. I've, I've been in the delivery room when, when uh, our, my children were born, and that is an incredible time to see God as he gives physical life, to hear that baby cry for the first time. And, and, and what an incredible thing that is. But consider also God is the giver of spiritual life. Not only does God have your days numbered and he knows what that second number on that tombstone will be and he knows what's going to happen in the middle with that dash and he knew when you were going to be born, but he is also the giver of spiritual life. And I want to be very conscious of the fact that there are maybe skeptics or unbelievers who are watching this morning. We welcome you to watch these services anytime that you want to. I just want to remind you and let you know, maybe for the first time today, that there is a God in heaven who is in control and he loves you. You ever just need to be reminded of that? I'm loved. Hey, it's difficult. For the mom that's sitting at home on the couch and her kids have been running around screaming, uh, our kids this week are having so much fun. They're running in circles. They ran headfirst into each other in the kitchen and we're screaming and crying, right? And there's a moment where you're going, man, this is supposed to last a couple more weeks, right? Can I remind you moms, moms and dads at home, God loves you. Can I remind you of something else? Maybe for the senior who's going, man, I don't get to have a regular senior year. God's in control and he loves you. For the person who's right before his, his retirement age and he's looking at his 401k suffer greatly right now, can I encourage you with something? God is in control and he loves you. Not only is God the giver of life, but God, uh, God holds our life in his hands but if the Lord wills, we also see right here, not only if the Lord will, we shall live, but also do. Our accomplishments are held in God's hands. We like to trust the Lord with the eternal aspect of our life, but, but we struggle a little bit with this one, I'm afraid. It's like, God, you take care of the, the big deal stuff, like, like uh, uh, the gospel as far as eternity is concerned. But when it comes to the daily thing, I want to maintain control of that one. 
what I do, what, where I go, the things I do. And God's word reminds us here that we ought to say, if we will, not only will we live, but we will do these things. Around the country today, pastors are find, finding themselves concerned with finances and canceling things that they've had planned for months. Businesses are having to lay workers off. Small businesses are wondering, are we even going to be able to stay open through this? People, many people are at home right now without a paycheck. Our church calendars, our church finances, our personal calendars, our personal finances, our small businesses are all in God's hands. And here's the encouraging thing about that. There is no better place for them to be. It goes against my flesh, man. I want to control these things. I, I want to, to keep a handle on them and make sure everything's going well. But, but when I realize that God's control is a whole lot better than mine, I can sleep a little bit better at night. The last thing I want to look at, verse number 7 of chapter number 5, he tells us to do this. Establish your hearts. So here's, here's what I want to encourage you with, uh, church family and friends, as we get ready to close this morning is you're supposed to ask this question, according to James. Not so much, what am I going to do, but if God wills, then this will happen. And, and, and here's the question. What is God's will in this difficulty? Right? I think probably for the believer, most of us are looking and going, God, what are you doing or trying to do in this? First Thessalonians gives us three very general things that are the will of God. And I just want to remind you of them, okay? Chapter number five, First Thessalonians tells you this. Three short sentences. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. There's a lot to rejoice about, isn't there? You know, a lot of this, if we can be honest, is just an issue of perspective. Some of us are, are looking and saying, oh man, I'm going to be in my home for a while and my kids are out of school. What am I going to do? The other side of that coin, the other perspective there is what a privilege and an opportunity to spend some extra quality time with that family of yours. What a privilege and an opportunity to see the world slow down. You know, we hear people all the time, at least up until a week ago, my schedule's too full, my life is too busy, I'll be able to take care of that when, when everything slows down. It just did. Rejoice evermore. The second thing, 1 first, first Thessalonians chapter 5 says this, pray without ceasing. You know, I hope, and, and, and I'm sure that this is going on, I really hope that during this time, heaven is filled with prayers from the children of God. I would love nothing more than for God to use this as an opportunity to stir up a revival amongst the church. And I believe he is, by the way. I believe it's happening. People are, are, are getting the gospel out. And we ought to be doing these things through the power of prayer. Maybe this is a good opportunity to get serious about prayer in your life. Maybe this is a good opportunity to get serious about teaching your children about the importance of prayer in their lives. Not only does he say, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, the last thing written there by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians is this. In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. I'm going to be honest with you, I've done my fair share of complaining and questioning during this this difficult time. I mean, probably many of us have. The Word of God says in everything to give thanks. I think it would be a good thing if Facebook pages were full of people, Christians, sharing things they're thankful for right now during this time. Can I be honest with you? I'm thankful for the opportunity to do live stream. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the people who are willing to come out this morning and help run this service and, and people running the media. I'm thankful that we're still able to connect through cell phones and, and to reach out and talk to one another. Believer, let there be a difference in your mindset during these difficult times. I want to remind you, God is not surprised. He's not been caught off guard. No, in fact, he put you and I here. This is incredible. He put you and I here for such a time as this. He knew when you were going to be born that you were going to live through this time and promised us 
that all things would work together for good for us. So I ask you this question, where is your mind? I think it's difficult for all of us, but is it consumed with your schedule and how you can fix it? Are our minds concerned, uh, c- concerned with our finances and, and consumed with these things and how we can fix them? Or are you living in the place of accepting where God has you right now and leaning into what He is going to do through you in this? Here's what I want to remind you with, and we're going to be done. I don't want our church family to be so caught up in the noise that we miss what God has for us in this. Remember this, during this difficult time, God is not on trial. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he only does good. God is not on trial, but during this time, our faith is. So I encourage you, be strong and of good courage. I encourage you during this time, focus on these things. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks. He's got the schedule. He'll take care of it. He's got the finances. He'll take care of it. God's always been good, He will always be good, and we at Crossway Church will continue to praise Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your goodness, for Your watch care, for Your love. God, thank You for the reality that we are not the ones in control, but You are. Help us today, myself, my church family, our friends, the other people who are out there going through difficulties. God, our world... Help us to experience the calm that comes from Jesus Christ. God, help the gospel to go out more powerful than ever before during this time. Lord, I lastly want to ask you to help us be able to meet together in person again here soon. Sustain our church family during this time, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.